everyone and welcome to this session about MCQ answering strategies. It's a very interesting session and it will contain some very intuitive and useful insights. But I would like to emphasize before I begin that the strategies which I will discuss may help you, may help you increase your score in a multiple choice test like the prelims, like CSAT, like GS prelims by a certain margin and in no way can these strategies ever substitute the power of knowledge itself with that qualifier with that caveat i can begin and tell you that there are some particularly effective ways of tackling multiple choice questions such that when you apply these techniques when you employ these techniques you may get slightly more marks than you would have received otherwise and that slightly more marks, that margin of increased marks, which you have just gotten because of your advanced answering strategies, not because of your knowledge, may make the difference between success and not making the cutoff. Here again, I need to qualify something and I need to be very clear. You see, this strategy, these strategies will help you clear the prelims if you are already near that cutoff, if you're already near that cutoff and many students have that issue. They sometimes are not able to clear the prelims because they are they have an issue with accuracy. They can't get enough questions right. They're always hovering around that cutoff. That's completely normal and I don't think it's any fault of anybody because it's just a very hard nut to crack, you know, because the competition levels are high and the cutoff can be so uh, tricky, so fine-tuned, so, so thin, that margin is so minuscule that it's easy to miss it by a point or two. These strategies may help you cross that margin, okay? But they will not help you substitute and clear the exam without putting effort. With that, let me explain to you where these strategies come from and how exactly they work. I'll take you through them uh, one by one and then I will walk you through the way and the mechanism of actually attempting the question paper of about 100 questions which you will face in the multiple choice Paper. The, these strategies can be applied in any multiple choice paper with a similar pattern and they will most likely yield some good results and get you some bonus marks. The, the good thing about these strategies is that the marks you will get because of these are just absolutely free, bonus. They, for those marks, you would have done nothing extra. You, would, you don't need to study, you don't need to uh, work harder than you already have. Whatever you have done, the idea of using these techniques is to just push it by a few more marks and those few more marks, two, three, four, five percent, two, three, four, five percent can mean a lot of difference between, uh, as you know, clearing the prelims and not clearing the prelims or in any tough competitions like this. These strategies come from probability, they come from mathematics. In when professional gamblers sometimes use very advanced strategies to beat a game of cards, to beat people at uh, poker or blackjack and those things which require mathematics, right? That we won't go into that detail, but the fundamental use of probability and statistics is very much apparent and it is what we will be using here. Now, these strategies are not, they have not been designed by me. They have been taken from research which has been published in this book it is called Rock, Paper, Scissors by William Poundstone. And it is a book of tricks, essentially, and scientific tricks. So I have gone through the book uh, in detail. And there is a section particularly devoted to outwitting and outguessing multiple choice tests. And it is from that chapter that I have distilled these insights and what I'm about to tell you, right? And so William Poundstone, the author, he analyzed 100 tests. So let's all already be aware that the sample size is 100 tests, about 2,500 questions he analyzed, all types of questions. He analyzed SATs, he analyzed all types of multiple choice questions. And he arrived at some patterns. He found some patterns. These patterns that he has found might be attributed to the human mind and to the psychology of the test taker. You see, as a human, ultimately, a machine may jumble and randomize all the questions and you may have all sorts of randomized and uh, very opaque type of mechanisms such that any such strategy doesn't work. But at the end of the day, there are certain tendencies which humans capture and there are certain limitations of language which can be harnessed, which can be exploited. And 
there are some very powerful ideas of statistics and probability. So we'll talk about those. So William Poundstone has analyzed a large number of questions in multiple choice questions. And he has found that questions which have very universal qualifiers, such as never, none, all, those should be rejected. They are more likely to be wrong than they are likely to be correct. It's not like it is a very given thing that if there is a uh, extreme type of statement, it is going to be wrong. It is not like that. It, the research is, the numbers are telling us that the probability of it being wrong is higher. Okay. And that helps us. I will tell you how to use it, but just know that this is one of the insights. Now, another qualifier, very important qualifier is that when you have questions which say none of the above or all of the above, they are likely to be correct. You see, if it's a perfectly random test and if all the options, you have four options in the UPSC prelims to choose from A, B, C, D. And if it is a perfectly random test, if it has completely been randomized, then the probability of each of them being correct should be 25%. 25% A is correct, 25% B, C, D. And they should be common in all questions, correct? This is how a completely perfectly random test would look like, right? But the numbers tell a slightly different story. They say, one of the things which I told you in the previous slide, questions and statements, options with universal qualifiers are likely to be wrong, more likely to be wrong. But there is an exception. That exception is this one. It says that if a question contains none of the above or all of the above, it is more likely to be correct. It is not that it will be correct or that it is going to be correct or that it has a very high probability of being correct. It has a more probability of being correct than it has a probability of being wrong. But ideally, it should have been 25%. It is not 25, it's more than 25. That is what we will use, right? So this is what, this is another very, very important insight which he has shared. A very interesting insight from his research and his numbers are suggesting that if in a multiple choice test, there are four options, like in your case, in the UPSC paper, there are four options, A, B, C, D. Option B is likely to be correct more than it should be. Like I said, if it's a perfectly random test and if you have a complete randomization of the probability of options being correct, then each of them should have a 25% probability. When the numbers are crunched and the data is collected, it turns out B is correct 28% of the time, not 25% of the time. Okay, that is a significant difference when you apply this technique in five or six questions, five or six questions, you may get two or three wrong, but just because of that increased probability of B being correct, you may get one extra question correct. And that can mean a jump. And of course, there is negative marking to consider. I will tell you how to buffer against that, how to hedge against that risk and how to exactly go through various options and how to make sure which questions are worth even attempting and which questions are worth leaving. But the insight from the number is suggesting that B is likely to be correct 28% of the time, whereas it should be correct 25% of the time. And it is also suggesting that if there are five options in the answer, A, B, C, D, E, then E is likely to be correct most of the times rather than B. If there are four options, A, B, C, D, B is likely to be correct 28% of the time. Okay. If there are five options in the question, A, B, C, D, E, then E is the most likely to be correct, statistically according to numbers. C, option C is the least likely to be correct. Another interesting thing, if it's a five option test, A, B, C, D, E options are there. E is most likely to be correct. Okay. It probability is higher than it should be. C is least likely to be correct. The probability of C being correct is only 17%. It should be a little higher. Okay, it should be if, if it's a perfectly random test and if it is perfectly controlled for any arbitrary, any arbitrary biases, then if there are five options, then the probability of each of them being correct, A, B, C, D, E should be 20% exactly. Right? 20% probability of A, B, C, D or E being correct. But it turns out that the probability of E being correct is the highest. The probability of C being correct is 17%, whereas it should be 20. Again, we will use this, but that's it's really interesting how you see numbers can give us these slight edges. Of course, it's not easy to really make a huge dent in your score, 
But even then, if you think about it, if you can capture two or three or four extra marks by using these strategies over a hundred question sample set, you're right. You, let us say you are going to get the cutoff is about say 90, roughly 90 in the UPSC prelims in GS. You are about to get 88 and you had prepared well and you, you know that you hover around that area. You are well prepared. You're going to get 88, 89. You're right around that edge. If you happen to get two or three extra by using nothing but strategies, answering strategies, and you end up with 91 instead of 88, it has made all the difference naturally. But again, it is not easy to use these techniques. I will tell you how to use them. And of course, you will test them before you use them. Very important. You will not use them until you test them and until you have confidence in them. No matter who says that these strategies work, you will first test them, you will try them out, you will see them, see how they are improving your score in the mock tests, only then will you use them properly in the actual exam. Okay? Regardless of who says anything, let anybody come and claim that they have figured out ways of beating the MCQ test. We will not believe until we ourselves have tested it. Okay? That is going to be our mantra here. So, another important insight which William Poundstone has figured out is that in a multiple choice test, the correct answer is not likely to be repeated. So if the correct answer for a question is A, then the correct answer of the next question is probably not going to be A. Again, the probability should be exactly 25%, but it is. it turns out it is not 25%. When the data is collected, it turns out that if one question correct answer is A, other questions correct answer is not A. Typically, it, the probability of it being repeated is 19%. It should be 25 if it's perfectly random. That means there is a bias, right, in the test, in multiple choice test, and this can be used. This means that if we are in a position of guessing, if, that, if, if we are in a position of guessing, we have eliminated one or two options out of the four options and we are now in a position of guessing we have to see which one to pick at that point in that situation we can use this if nothing else comes to mind if nothing else is coming to our rescue we may use this technique we may say that since the above question is the correct answer was a or b or c whatever let me avoid that one if that option is open to me right if that option is still available to me in my question where I have to guess and the I know the answer for the above question above or I know the answer to the question below, the question after, I can just simply avoid that if I'm going to guess anyway, right? So that at least gives me some probability to get it correct. And that some probability, like I said, can add up. If you add up 100 questions or so, it can add up. Another interesting thing he has discovered, he has figured out. That is the answer option uh, in a multiple choice test, A, B, C, D are options given to you. The choice with the longest word length is likely to be correct. This is more of a, a common sense than a finding, but still it is a significant finding because he has correlated it with the fact that you see, if out of four options, one of them is correct, the test taker has to put extra effort in making sure he qualifies the correct statement and it is undisputed, not controversial. In order to make it uncontroversial, in order to make it indisputable, he may add some more words to make sure the statement is comprehensive. You understand? And that can lead to it sticking out. So, again, if we are in a position of choosing, of guessing, if we are going to guess, it is better for us to pick the option with the most number of words. The longest statement is slightly more likely to be correct than the shorter ones. That also he has found out. So, according to this book and according to the findings that she has figured out, these are the strategies and these are the improvements in random guessing which he has found. Some of them are very high. So, he, according to his data, if you pick none of the above or all, the, all of the above, it can lead to a 90% improvement in your score versus not choosing this, this uh, use, not using this strategy. Picking B on a four choice test can lead to 11% improvement over random guessing. 
so say for instance there is a question and in that question you have to you, you have two options you either choose b according to this strategy or you randomly guess you just do like a coin toss you just do some random guessing you say, i don't know which one i'll just take this one so if you have chosen b probability of it being correct is going to be 11% more than if you had chosen randomly that is what this number means okay the last one is that avoiding the previous choice like i told you that there is going to be there is he has found that there is a pattern that the previous questions the questions the correct answers are not repeated in mcqs perhaps it's because test takers wish to make sure that that is that there is no repetition also you probably don't expect a string of answers which are correct right so the previous choice can be avoided this is a useful strategy but again you see the effectiveness over random guessing the most powerful strategy is the one in the top less next more powerful is the one is is picking b in a four choice test and the least powerful amongst them is picking is not trying to repeat the numbers right <clears throat> and so with these insights how do we use uh, these ideas to help us navigate a question paper of gs prelims again i must qualify this because i cannot stress this enough i will never never recommend that you use any type of strategies or any type of shortcuts to substitute knowledge and hard work never that should never be the case you would always focus and put your energy in learning such that when the examination comes it is your knowledge which takes you through that elimination process and it is your knowledge and your confidence and you having actually read and taken the pains of reading stuff which nobody else may have gone through it can help you figure out a few more questions and those few more questions will lead you to the finish line but assuming that that doesn't happen and it does not happen at times because uh, the options in prelims in gs particularly can be very close very minute very very detailed and very hard to outguess so with that situation of having very close hard to eliminate options which don't lend themselves easily to any strategy what remains for us what do we do in a 100 question test what i will tell you next is a proper answer uh, answer writing strategy in a multiple choice question this is what you do let us say the question paper comes to you the first thing you do is go through the all the questions in the test and eliminate do not mark any questions as correct and not correct in your omr sheet in your answer sheet in the first round only eliminate wrong options there is a difference i will repeat this for the sake of clarity do not mark the right or wrong answers in the first round the first round of your reading of the question paper is only for the elimination of obviously wrong choices there is a scientific reason for this which is not mentioned in the book it comes from insights from other books from other readings and from other analysis and it is this when test takers revise in a multiple choice question test their improvement and accuracy jumps immediately the reason i am telling you to avoid marking an answer in your omr sheet or in your answer sheet in the first go is because you might mistake might make a few silly mistakes and no matter how confident you may feel at that point that this option is correct i know this one and it it of course might be in, in some questions it will be that way you will know that answer it is best to just hold on to your horses because you may be surprised if you revisit that question if you attempt 10 questions like that and you know exactly and you are confident 100% that 10 of them are correct i know the answer to this one it's this 10 you have attempted if you revisit it is possible that one in one you have not considered another option which might be correct it is possible and we don't want to lose that any marks to silly mistakes because remember if you commit such a mistake not only have you lost uh, one mark or whatever score you will get for a correct answer 
there is going to be a negative marking penalty for it so that absolutely has to be taken out of the equation silly mistakes are not allowed therefore in the first round we only eliminate and do nothing else okay once that is done we then come to the second round in the second round now as we go now you start taking the answers which you are confident about no guessing strategies yet in the second round you start answering the questions which you are confident about which you know about which you just he held yourself back from answering in the first round because in the first round it was all just eliminating the bad options okay so because now that in you are in the second round and you have completed the first round in the second round you will have eliminated certain options you will attempt all the questions about which you are very confident next you will attempt only those questions in which you have eliminated at least one option in the first round you were doing elimination of options if you have eliminated at least one option it is better if you have eliminated two options because if you have eliminated two then you are about at 50% probability of the right answer already if you have eliminated two correctly right so what you need to do is start trying to answer questions in which only in which three or less correct answers are remaining or in other words in which you have been able to eliminate one option and you know at least this is not the right answer those you start to target now if you use these techniques which i mentioned before they will work if you use the techniques all throughout the questions in which you have eliminated at least one if in a question you have not been able to confidently eliminate even one option if you have not been able to confidently eliminate even one option you will not attempt that question at all i hope that is very clear i will repeat that again for the sake of clarity because the stakes are very high i want to be very clear i don't want to leave any room for confusion this is serious stuff if in a question you have not been able to eliminate any option it is not worth doing it is not worth attempting you will leave it blank you cannot take the risk of negative marking in that question of course this is understood it is obvious and common sensical however if you have eliminated one option or if you have eliminated two options you can apply these strategies in all such questions it is better if you apply these guessing strategies in all such questions why because these strategies are not guaranteed to get you to the right answer but here is the law of averages which comes to our rescue you see if the sample set is large assume that in your round 2 of answering you have eliminated x number of questions and you are left with a pool of about 20 questions say which is a fair number 20 questions in which only one option you have eliminated one or maybe two now but you don't know the correct one you don't know the correct answer a lot of questions will fall under this category you don't know the correct answer and you don't know how to guess you are conflicted right now you have to decide whether you will attempt those questions or you will not attempt those questions at all the ones in which you have eliminated one option or two that is a critical decision and that is where these strategies come into the picture if we are following these strategies these nadesh method it it suggests that we attempt all such questions we attempt all such questions in which we have eliminated at least one option based on these strategies we answer those questions why because if you use these strategies on a large number of questions on say 20 questions 30 questions it is not likely that you will get all of them correct in fact that is not going to happen at all what will happen actually is that you will get about 5 to 10% more accuracy in guessing those 20 or 30 questions than you would have received otherwise or then you would have received by not answering at all or that 5 to 10% extra you would have received if you had answered incorrectly 
okay so answering those questions in which you have eliminated at least one option may be a good idea of course we will test this principle before applying it in the main exam and i will tell you how okay now i will give you one example of how to use those different strategies say this is your situation the answer to the first question you know is c you have marked it in your after your first round in second round you have marked it. the second question you don't know you don't know what it is going to be okay and you have eliminated one option say you have eliminated one option that is why you are attempting it because there is negative marking in the third also you know the third also you know the third one you know the answer is d in your opinion now we apply these strategies and we see is there a question which has none of the above or all of the all of the above if yes we may vote okay yes it is there or if it is not there we cannot use it we then ask ourselves is the option b available yes the option b is available in this case in the second question the option b is available then we ask ourselves is b repeating in the above question in the lower question no so two of those strategies can be are actually applicable in this case one b is open it might be the correct answer two it is b is not the correct answer for the question number one it is not the correct answer for question number three therefore by using that logic that they uh, our correct answers don't repeat typically by using that intuition by that statistical insight we may choose b and because we have used this strategy all properly in this type of form we very well may arrive at the right answers and if you use stuff like this over 20 30 questions 20 30 questions it is very likely your score will jump about 5 5% i would not claim 10 because i do not want to give you any unrealistic hopes although it is very likely that it might even cross 5 or 10 okay because these are powerful techniques and they can statistics is very powerful mathematics is very powerful and the, if if used correctly it can have huge impacts but it is not easy to use you see for one one difficulty which people find is they get cold feet they are not able to use these strategies on a large number of questions because they become too afraid they become too paralyzed with fear right this stuff works when it is used on the larger number of set of questions you use the more it's going to work so that's how the law of averages works right now coming to something very important which i have been stressing which i will again stress with even more emphasis you need to practice this stuff i am sending to you i am linking for you the article in which i have listed all these insights and the ways of solving i want you to test them i want you to take these insights and test them on mock tests on mock tests i want you i would like you to at least try three mock tests using these techniques and see see if your score is improving or not very important for you only then will you have the confidence of using them otherwise you can disregard this entire discussion it's completely fine right but if you plan to use please don't go ahead and use these techniques on two or three questions and expect there to be a large difference there will not be much difference in your score it will work only if you are able to use them properly if you are able to use them on a large number of questions i will once again for the sake of clarity repeat the protocol of answering the questions for your benefit in the first round of reading the questions we only eliminate bad options in the question paper we do not answer any questions in our final answer sheet in the second round we start answering the questions which we are confident about very confident about first then we answer only questions in which we have been able to eliminate one or two wrong options only those we will we will try to attempt but we will attempt all such questions according to these strategies we will attempt all such questions okay we will not be then selective 
and say that I'm not feeling correct in this. So I'm not going to use the strategy here. I'll use the strategies there and so on. It's better to use them on a large number because we are looking for that final boost in score, not for getting one or two questions correct or incorrect. We want them to be as high as possible. You know, and it will work if you apply them on a large number of questions. Then apply these strategies. Look for the option B if it is open. Look for none of the above, all of the above options if it is open. And last of all, when you are trying to guess a correct answer, try not to repeat the answer above or below. Try. That should be the last strategy. Right? This is, I know it is a lot because it's a lot of um, logical talk. It's a lot of talk which is abstract and it is hard for you to perhaps imagine because there is no question paper in front of you. So I want you to practice this. I want you to put it into really uh, that you see the test of the entire thing is in the pudding and the pudding comes when you score higher than you normally typically deserve. That is what makes it a hack. That is what makes it a cheat code. It doesn't work otherwise, right? So like I've been telling you, I would like you to test these Go through that article, go through it again and again and again until it goes in your mind and you figure out that, yes, this is actually working. When I use it for 10, say, I, when I use it for 20 questions, I use it for 20 questions, I end up getting a score of 8 after negative marking. Whereas when I don't use it, I get a score of 6. 2 are free for me. 2 are just extra bonus marks, which I get for using these techniques. That is why I'll use it. And that is the only expectation which you should have from techniques like these. Nothing more than that. If you are going to invest time, it is better to invest time in reading and knowledge rather than thinking that any such technique can come to your risk. Okay. Nothing beats hard work. That is a fundamental rule. There is no bigger MCQ hack or cheat code than that. Nothing will beat hard work. However, given the amount of hard work you may have already done if you would like to have a strategic advantage and if you have the mindset and the statistical understanding of things you may be able to get a few more marks extra for no effort of yours by using such techniques properly with that said i leave you with these ideas and i leave you with the article itself which lists all of this and I would like you to try and test it before you attempt it. And with that, I will um, bid you farewell. I will see you next time. I hope that uh, stuff like this interests you, it intrigues you. In any case, it is interesting. And the fact that uh, whether you use it in prelims or in the UPSC or not, this stuff, you see, it's a statistical thing. and. Uh, Many of these insights are universally applicable. I don't want to say more. You are smart enough to utilize these insights in your life. I am sure during one situation or the other, they will help you. Take care and I will see you next time.